Welcome to the session entitled Extractivism and Social Movements. My name is Andrea Sempertegui and I am an incoming assistant professor of politics at Whitman College in the United States and a member of the anti-extractive collective Comunalysis in Ecuador. So to begin, I would like to share with you what I've planned to cover during this short session. First, I will offer a very basic definition of extractivism. Second, I will introduce you to how this term has been broadened and critically conceptualized in the last years with a particular focus on Latin America. And in a third and last step, I will center on the important role that social movements have played in shaping these different approaches to extractivism and also in offering alternatives towards post-extractive societies. So what is extractivism? The basic definition of extractivism, which is also a descriptive one, is that extractivism encompasses all of those activities which remove or extract great quantities of natural resources that are not then processed or are done so in a limited fashion and that leave a country as exports. When we talk about natural resources, we are concretely talking about hydrocarbons like oil and gas, crucial for mass transportation, like airplanes and cars, for heating systems and for the production of plastics. We're also talking about minerals like copper and lithium, crucial for the production of batteries in computers, cell phones and electric vehicles. And monocrops like soy, crucial for feeding livestock that is then used for meat and dairy production. However, I would like to move beyond this descriptive definition of extractivism and introduce you to the work of scholars researching on and from Latin America, where this concept has widely circulated since the global energy boom in the 2000s, a period during which the high prices of commodities like oil, copper, and soy due to the growing international demand for these raw materials increase state dependency on extractive ac activities. So since the 2000s, this concept has been infused with new and broader meanings related to theories of development and colonialism, forms of capitalist accumulation and resistance, and the financial economy and other ways of extracting value. The reason for this regional focus is that Latin America has been a center for intellectual production and extractivism, given the historical role of Latin American economies as exporters of raw materials, and given the significant influence that movements resisting extractivism have played in the intellectual production of this concept in the last decades. This regional focus does not mean that this concept is not useful or does not apply to other regions like Africa, Asia, North America, and even Europe. On the contrary, the study of extractivism has been widely adopted, adapted, and further developed by scholars around the world. However, this regional focus will allow us to gain a situated perspective on how extractivism concretely shapes post-colonial societies and the global economy as a whole. What are different approaches to extractivism coming from Latin America? As previously mentioned, there is a variety of approaches that have brought in it the concept of extractivism or extractivismo in Spanish in the last decades. For a matter of time, I will mostly focus on two during this lecture. And it is important to say that these approaches are not separated from each other. On the contrary, they are interconnected and the people who have developed them are often in dialogue and critical engagement with each other, as we will see next. So the first approach conceptualizes extractivism as a mode of accumulation that varies during different phases of capitalism. Scholars like Eduardo Budinas, Alberto Acosta, or Maristela Svampa, among many others, differentiate different types of extractivism according to the different modes of accumulation that have characterized them. Even though Latin American history has been marked by the extraction of natural resources since colonial times, extractivism has muta mutated along with capitalism's different phases. 
In fact, these scholars argue that it is not possible to conceptualize contemporary forms of extractivism without understanding how former colonies, which then became independent nation states, have been relegated to the role of peripheral economies and exporters of raw materials to nourish the demands from the centers of political and economic power like Europe and the United States. Here I would like to invite you to watch the excellent Connected Sociology session entitled Colonial Dispossession and Extraction by Su Min Ku, which I added in the list of resources. At the same time, these scholars argue that with each phase of capitalism, resource extraction has changed and translated into new modes of accumulation, moving from example from colonial plunder to independence era enclave economies, and global demand for natural resources has also taken new shapes with new powers like China driving the demand for raw materials nowadays. When we talk about modes of accumulation, we are talking about the ways in which resources are owned, administrated and invested. So are resources owned and administrated by the state or by transnational companies? Is the money coming from the extractive uh, industry and projects going to be invested in education or health? Or is it going to be used for private profit or to pay for debt? So these scholars argue that during the 80s and the 90s, the dominant form of extractivism in Latin America was neoliberal extractivism, which was characterized by the limited role of the state in extractive projects and the transfer of extractive licenses to participants in the open market. This is transnational corporations like Chevron Texaco or Shell instead of state-owned companies. Neoliberal extractivism was also characterized by the expansion of extractive projects as means to access international loans or to pay foreign debt. Many countries in Latin America, given their subordinated position in the global economy, were going through different economic crises at that time, and the licensing of extractive projects to international investors was often a condition for these countries to get loans approved by institutions like the International Monetary Fund. And neoliberal extractivism was also characterized by the pastoral role of extractive companies who compensated for the state's absence in terms of social services and infrastructure projects. Given that the productive and distributive functions of Latin American states were reduced during this neoliberal period, extractive companies often compensated for the state's absence in communities living close to extractive projects. That way, they also created a relationship of dependence with these community, communities and pacified resistance against extractive activities. According to these scholars, starting in the 2000s, we see the implementation of a different type of extractivism with a new mode of accumulation. The reasons for the emergence of this new extractivism are on the one hand, and as I already mentioned, the high prices for commodities like oil, and on the other hand, the electoral success of leftist or progressive political parties in countries like Argentina, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, among others. Many of these governments came to power by promising that they would dismantle neoliberalism and change the way of administrating extractive projects. And this is what these scholars call neo-extractivism. So new extractivism was characterized by the massive territorial expansion of the extractive frontier to areas previously considered non-productive. This includes territories inhabited by indigenous and peasant communities. New extractivism was also characterized by the increasing role of the state in extractive projects. For example, some state-owned companies had a bigger participation in the extractive sector or the state would collect higher taxes from extractive corporations. And finally, neo extractivism was characterized by the state's investment of extractive revenues in public sectors like health and education, in infrastructure projects like highways, in developmental programs aimed to reduce poverty and inequality, and in monetary compensations for local communities affected by extractive projects. So, well, while these approaches acknowledged that there were improvements during the neo-extractive period, especially in terms of the reduction of poverty, they were 
also very critical towards this mode of accumulation. These scholars argue that new extractivism did not only continue Latin Americans' peripheral role as exporter of primary commodities, but even intensified the region's dependency in the global energy market by massively expanding extractive activities in territories where they did not exist before. They also argued that the negative social ecological impacts of extractive activities continued and intensified given the immense scale of extractive projects like mega mining projects. Lastly, these scholars argue that colonial and capitalist dynamics of territorial occupation and dispossession continued and intensified and that it is not coincidence that since the new extractive period, there has been an explosion of conflicts over natural resource extraction in the region. As you can see here on this map taken from the Environmental Justice Atlas, which is a project developed by environmental organizations across the world that I also added into the list of owner resources to this session, there is a total of 1,020 reported cases of conflicts related to natural resource extraction in Latin America and the Caribbean to this date. Despite the fact progressive governments enjoyed popular support and invested in developmental projects to pacify anti-extractive resistance, many communities mobilized against extractive projects and also against the kind of development they were offered by the state, which did not respect their relationship to their territories and their forms of living. The second approach I would like to cover during this session conceptualizes extractivism as a discourse shaped by social movements. This is the case of the work of Thea Rio Francos, a political scientist who analyzes the role of social movements, activists, and intellectuals in shaping debates about extractivism. Specifically, Rio Francos defines extractivism as, I quote, a central term that unifies a discourse articulated by situated actors reflecting on and critiquing historically specific models of accumulation." End of the quote. While scholars analyzing new extractivism have done important work to show from a macroanalytical perspective the negative social ecological effects of the massive expansion of extractivism, they often explain the multiplication of anti-extractive movements as a response to the expansion of extractivism, as I showed before. In contrast, the second way of defining extractivism centers on the collective agency and intellectual contribution of grassroots activists who, through their intertwined activities of critique and mobilization, shape the lines of political confrontation around extractivism and thus influence intellectual elaborations on this term. For example, in Ecuador, the indigenous movement, one of the strongest and best organized social movements in the region and sometimes in the hemisphere, has played a huge role in contributing to an understanding of extractivism beyond a descriptive definition that merely focuses on explaining how extractive operations negatively impact local communities. Since the founding of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, CONAIE, in 1986, the indigenous movement has combined direct action strategies to halt expansion of oil projects, especially in the Ecuadorian Amazon, with public declarations and proposals that underscore the colonial and capitalist dimensions of neoliberal extractivism and neo extractivism. At the same time, the indigenous movement has contributed with alternative proposals for post-structive futures like summa causae, which means good living in English, and proposes new forms of relation between human beings and nature and among human beings, and the rights of nature, a proposal that recognizes nature as a legal entity whose existence and regeneration of its vital cycles should be respected. Both of these proposals were adopted in Ecuador's 2008 constitution after years of political mobilization of CONAIE against neoliberal governments. The important role of Ecuador's indigenous movement in shaping and broadening our understanding of extractivism evinces grassroots activists as political and epistemic subjects. In what's left of this session, I would like to focus on the role of a different movement organized against extractivism in Ecuador, 
who has also broadened uh, current definitions of extractivism and presented its own alternative proposals for a post-extractive society. This is the case of the Amazonian women or the Mujeres Amazonicas in Spanish. In October 12, 2013, a date that commemorates Indigenous Peoples Day, a coalition of approximately 200 Indigenous women from the Ecuadorian Amazon walked an eight day long march from their communities in the rainforest to the capital city of Ecuador, Quito. This mobilization was called the March for Life, and it was a collective and powerful act to challenge the complete exclusion of indigenous women's voices and the voices from their community bases from the government's plans to massively expand oil projects in indigenous territories. More specifically, the Amazonian woman marched to protest the government's decision to open the licensing process for the 11th oil round, which is a massive oil licensing round that divided approximately two thirds of Ecuador's rainforest into 16 oil blocks, the orange blocks on the slides. This oil round intended to expand oil extraction historically concentrated in the northern Amazon to the center south, and it included oil extraction in the Yasuni National Park, one of the most biodiverse places on earth, and also where Waurani and indigenous communities living in voluntary isolation live. Since the Amazonian women organized their first march, they have emerged as visible actors of indigenous anti-extractive and feminist movements and have influenced and contributed to debates on extractivism in Ecuador and beyond. With their public speeches, manifestos and declarations, the Amazonian women have specifically contributed to highlight the patriarchal dimensions of extractivism, which include the masculinization of decision-making processes, product of how the state and extractive companies primarily engage with male interlocutors, the introduction of hierarchical and monetarized relations by extractive companies in which it's mostly men who are offered short-term jobs underpinning the figure of the male provider and the dependent woman in local communities, the disproportionate violence that women experience in extractive circuits as a result of how the greater presence of male workers in extractive projects restructure community spaces and daily life. An example of this is the increase of cases of sexual violence and abuse in communities next to extractive projects. And a final dimension is how women leaders who resist or speak up against the negative impacts of extractive projects experience several threats against their lives, including death. This is the case of many leaders of the Amazonian women, but also of others in Latin America, like Berta Cáceres here on the slide, an indigenous leader of the Lenca people leading the fight against a hydroelectric dam in Honduras before she was killed by hired hitmen linked to the hydroelectric company and US military trained forces in 2016. All of these experiences made visible by the Amazonian women and similar collectives across Latin America have forced current scholars of extractivism to broaden our analysis about its logics and effects and to develop understandings that focus on the patriarchal dimensions of extractive occupation. At the same time, the patriarchal violence exerted against women's bodies in extractive circuits does not mean that activists like the Amazonian women are merely victimized actors who only speak up against this violence. On the contrary, they have also presented their own post-extractive proposals, thus positioning themselves as political and epistemic subjects. This is the case of the Amazonian woman's Causaxacha or Living Forest Declaration that they presented to the government and the general public in October 2013. This document declares the Amazon as a living entity and rather than an abstract idealization of nature, it seeks to establish a new relation to nature more than human entities and the Amazon rainforest. Summing up, the indigenous movement and collectives like the Amazonian women show the important role that social movements have played in expanding our understanding of extractivism beyond descriptive definitions that only focus on its operational characteristics. 
With this, I don't want to say that intellectual work is superfluous or that theories of dependency or capitalist accumulation are not relevant to understand extractivism. On the contrary, contributions from social movements and public intellectuals are necessary to reveal and resist the continuity of regimes of colonial capitalist and patriarchal power that fuel environmental degradation and the climate crisis. Thank you. <laughs>